Sandy, that was not too bad um, in terms of your timing. As you said, it'll be difficult to pull you off, and you did great, so thank you. <laughs> um, this was great, and um, first of all, we've just had a great panel. Um, really, everyone's sharing from different perspectives where um, Sister Anne really spoke about meeting people where they are um, and identifying opportunities to address those needs and aligning priorities along those lines as well with different organizations, which I think is important. Um, we also had Adan, who really spoke about how to create this linkage, right, between the Latino community and the health services, particularly as we think about end of life. And so just really being, again, focused on this cultural perspective. And then, of course, um, uh, Sandy really spoke a lot about thinking about how do we create the appropriate resources and tools that can be replicated in such a way that really understands the depth of value related to culture, related to beliefs, even taboo and myths, et cetera, but also also being able to not just create or reinvent the wheel, but to be able to use what's out there. And I think um, Dr. Johnson spoke a little bit about that earlier. It's just like we really don't need to create all these new ideas and programs any, as much as we need to really start thinking about what really works and then how do we move that work forward and making sure it's addressing the needs. So that being said, first of all, thank you all so much again for your, your, your awesome talks. And now we're going to open it to the audience. Um, we would love to open, if anyone, there's two mics on each side, please feel free to go to a mic at this time. And uh, any questions that you have, please feel free to direct it to the panelists. And don't forget also that there's some, um, uh, feel free to use the Twitter handles. And also there'll be also people who'll be asking questions from the internet, the broader audience beyond those in the room. Hi, um, Sandy and Adan, those were great presentations. Thank you so much. This is just, uh, I'm struck by something um, presented by Sister Anne. Um, your program really exemplifies um, an attempt to interrupt generational cycles of trauma by working with parents and including parents. And it's, it's interesting because in our movement in, in ACEs and in trauma, oftentimes there's a focus singularly on children as if children exist in isolation. And I think that's because children are cute. Um, you don't blame children. And right when you become 18, somehow something changes and we have less compassion. Um, every ACE is traditional adverse childhood experience is adult mediated. And so your uh, focus on helping parents heal seems very powerful to me. And I'm wondering, you know, you have a, a, a pediatric or child focus to your organization. How did you um, come to focus on parents, and, and do you f are there challenges with funding or with um, compassion or sympathy in the in the community in terms of your work with parents to help interrupt those aces and the physiological impacts of those aces and the generational cycles of trauma? Thank you for that question. Um, I think my background in peds really did help um, because. As a nurse, we know we need to plan for discharge at admission, right? And unless I'm taking this baby home in my pocket, along with every other one, I probably should teach the parents how to give this amoxicillin or to, to flush this central line. So that concept, um, the transgenerational process um, that contributes to poor health outcomes and poverty, we're in fifth generation, what we call welfare down there. So somebody's got to break the cycle and the power lays with the parents. So my love is for this child, um, and we certainly do a lot of programs with kids, always inclusive of the parents, because their trauma is similar to what will happen the next. One of the things we do on our assessment, um, we do a very extensive parent survey, and one of those 10 domains is tell me about your childhood trauma. Um, we don't say, did you have? We say, tell me about, and 80% will give you a horrible story. So, um, and then the next phase is to, to teach them what power they have. Um, what do you want for your child? And we, you know, so there's a survey and it says criminal, you know, college educated, happy, um, murderous, you know, there's all these kind of, and of course we know what they're gonna say about what they want. And so here's a way you have that power. In that, they're healing. It's just quite intriguing to watch it. So yes, the love of the child, it's always getting under, under, under the barriers. What's stopping this um, from becoming a reality? Yeah, thank you so much. You have You're a very welcome. impressive thank program. You. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. We have one online, yep, we... and then we'll move over to the mic on the left. 
So, yes, keep your questions coming in if you're watching online. We have Tanita Daschel who asks, can any of the panelists address their partnerships with hospitals and how to get those decision makers involved or educated about the importance of health equity? Okay. Huh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think my uh, little experience with in California, uh, I think important part is uh, we got to build our reputation and be known by the uh, community in general. Then uh, the health providers will start to hear the um, good words from the patients or family member because we i'm talking specifically for chinese community it's a very uh small close community everybody almost know everybody so they heard what we did and our volunteers go everywhere try to volunteer uh, for the end of life patient so they kind of know us already <laughs> then um i will we will uh, go uh talk to the um administration, let them understand what we need. For instance, we greatly need uh, end-of-life relayed uh, medical interpreters because interpreter doesn't mean they know how to handle the end-of-life issue because after all, they are Chinese. So they don't know how to talk about death. What can I say? It? So doctor doesn't know what the interpreter say and interpreter don't feel comfortable. So those kind of issues you have to explain to them, the decision maker, I think that will be uh, more efficient, yeah. So uh, with our specific agency, um, we do have multiple partnerships with uh, the hospitals. I believe that our best connection within the health systems is with the social workers more than uh, with um, other providers within the the, the, uh, the health system, but um, you know we did work with Kaiser Permanente, one of the health systems in the Northwest, uh, in uh, the the model that I was mentioning, and that was integrating a community health worker into their system. But it was, um, I guess, an integration of in the health system, but also in the community. So I had access to um, the um, Epic or the electronic medical records within the, the health system. Mm -hmm. So the, I was able to communicate with providers and they were able to get updates on what I was doing with their clients. Um, I think, you know, we're still not there. I, I know that there's a lot of um, things that obviously need to need to happen, but I think um, out in the Northwest, the, the health systems are slowly starting to recognize, you know, the impact of community health workers. Um, I know that there's other um, agencies that are currently working with the health systems um, in providing services to multiple communities of color. Um, so it is, we started that process initially with Kaiser and um, you know, slowly other agencies are, um, are moving in and pr uh, providing that same service. But I think the, the difficult part of um, our service is kind of you know, finding that way of uh, being reimbursed for the services, the payment model, which everybody's exploring. So we do have a package that we created for, that we worked on for over two years. Um, that's also on our website. And I do have a hard copy with me. Um, but, you know, I, I think just uh, the fact that um, they're slowly starting to, to work with other agencies. Um, I know that there's more that needs to happen. Um, but um, I think we need, to, we need to do more of that because what's happening right now is obviously not, not, not working as, um, as fast as we would like. And um, our clients are still going back to the ER. They're still you know, um, developing all those conditions there. The costs are going high and there needs to find a way. And maybe community health workers are one of the options, but there's multiple others that can be explored as well. Well, we don't have hospitals, so ours is a little bit easier, but we do um, things like this, come and speak with larger groups, um, make those relationships with the local pediatricians. We certainly get referrals from the hospital, um, but funding is seriously the most difficult thing that I deal with. I just had to drop three counties because I can't afford the nurses out there. Um, our celebration is that we made payroll, not that we have surplus, we're in debt, um, but we're 20 years old and we have 18 full-time uh, workers and we hire another 25 teens during the summer. 
So I never know, and there we go with the faith walk, how it's going to work out. But we, we just share the passion over and over how we would love to work um, with physicians and in hospitals is to obviously have people there. Um, but we don't have that kind of capacity at this point, and I'm not sure it would be um, beneficial because then we would get referrals we can't take care of. So that's a little bit of a sad news, right? Excellent. Thank you all. Um, I think also, just to add to this, there's something to be said about aligning our priorities. And so identifying, I think you actually spoke about this earlier, Sister Anne, um, as well as also um, uh, Tim, that there's an important aspect around when we think about what is what are the needs that an organization has and what are the needs that the health system has to has to meet if you will or requirements and how to align those priorities in such a way that ends up being mutually beneficial and i think you spoke about that particularly around the health system and engaging with the research world um, and i think that that's always a, a, an opportunity to step back and think about how can we align those priorities in a way that really will be able to move both groups forward and create a win-win so i think that's important too thank you uh, hi, uh, I'm Tom Quinn. I'm a nurse with the Jewish Social Service Agency Hospice right here in Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, I was uh, interested, uh, particularly Sandy and, and uh, Adan, about the, um, the education that you do for professionals to, I, I assume, to help them connect with the people in your communities. And I'm just wondering what that looks like. What do you, how do you approach them? What's the actual training? Uh, uh, both content and process. How do you go about training the professionals to interact well with um, uh, with the uh, Latino and Chinese communities? Uh, my professional training normally go two way. One is when invited by the uh, hospitals or hospice agency. Uh, or community grassroots organization, we will go out there based on their needs. Most time it's a hospital, palliative care team. Sometimes it's uh, in service in the hospital, uh, like a, a ground table like this one. And then sometimes um, we will do specific training. Uh, but my focus mostly is how to help um, our health provider better communicate with our Chinese speaking uh, patient and the family. It's very important how to communicate with the families. Um, so because of that, so we focus a lot with a, with a very practical um, understanding of the cultural issue, why 11 p.m. we have tons of Chinese family members surrounding that Sandy. You know, they won't go, right? It's a part of a culture, but how are we going to do it? How are we going to say it? And we will share that with them. So we have a lot of uh, um, conversation among the, uh, the team who invite us and uh, with our team. The other one we do is uh, the foreign the professional medical professional forum we do it almost once a year sometimes more than once and what we do is during those time we invite the community uh, leaders or uh, health providers coming here who serve the chinese uh, patients for with a lots of different experience can be in the community can be in the hospital they're coming to have a specific topic to share that, and then we definitely will provide a CME or CEU for our health providers to uh, for them to learn together. Uh, we always give them a heart-to-heart -heart cafe discussion, and when we go to the agency, they find out this car is not just for their patients; it's for the staff, almost like a team building. Right? People say, I didn't know that you, you like to go outside. You're an outdoor person, I never knew that. Anyway, so I think we just have, cannot separate our health provider as uh, lay people. We are all human beings. We all go into facing that day. And maybe we can think about that ourselves for our families. A lot of times, doctor will say, okay, I don't get two deck of a car to play with my wife. Right? So I don't know if that answers your question. So um, at our agency, uh, we do it in three, three different ways. Um, the first one is that we develop a training online. There's an online training that um, health professionals are able to take, and they get CEU credits. And we did that in collaboration with the University of San Marcos in California. 
Um, and basically, anybody that um, has access to the web can go and take that training at any time. Um, the other training that we provide uh, is the in-person training. We do go to, um, I would say, you know, uh, hospital, or clinic, or a uh, community agency that wants to um, receive that training as well. Um, and the last one, um, the I guess the training about how to better serve Latinos happens at our conference as well. We we have those, I guess, three options because we know that with, uh, you know, medical providers, um, the time and the flexibility is not always there. So there is that, that, uh, that option that they have uh, to be able to access and receive the training. And the training itself is in how to engage better with uh, the community. But we focus on uh, very specific things. Uh, we talk about family. We talk about respect. We talk about, you know, um, certain things that um, the Latino patient might not be um, asking because they're, they don't have the trust. So uh, we emphasize very much on building the trust on spending that time on connecting with that patient and getting to know that patient uh, on addressing them, um, you know, based uh, on the age. Um, so we focus on, you know, using señor, señora, usted. So those things you know, can go a long way. You don't have to speak the language, but if you do use certain things like that, you know, they can, they can go a long way, the handshakes, you know, and things like that. Um, so we do emphasize on those specific things because, you know, building the trust and building that connection um, long-term is gonna be very helpful, not only for the provider, but also the patient in having a better health outcome. Hi, I'm Pat Bamba. I'm a geriatrician and I'm a member of the round table and I lead New York's um, MOLST and EMOLST program, and I'm a founding member of National Pulse. I wanted to thank everyone for really a consistent message of the value of um, bridging community and the healthcare team. And I wanted to really focus, uh, Don, on a very important nugget that I found from your story of how you recognized the um, patients' lack of understanding of their health status and prognosis and how important that was in terms of getting him back to the physician and getting at what I think is the heart of the important outcome, doing person-centered care. And it changed the whole dynamic for this gentleman in terms of figuring out what his goals were for the last part of his life. So thank you for that. And I wonder if you have really looked at the, the wonderful outcomes that you may not even recognize that you've achieved in terms of the collaboration in advanced care planning, not only in terms of that person-centered care, but the value to the healthcare system in terms of reducing unwanted hospitalizations, unwanted emergency room visits, and again, the most important, having him go back to his family where that's where he wanted to achieve his end of life. So I wonder if you're collecting any of those outcomes or working with anyone that can help you to gain sustainability and expansion of your program. So um, that, is a, that is a good question. Um, at the moment, we are not collecting that information. Um, so uh, I guess my work right now is with multiple health systems. We're still working with um, Kaiser, Kaiser members or Kaiser clients, um, but at the same time, I'm also working with um, clients from other um, health systems. Um, but I think Kaiser was primarily the one that, you know, was very helpful in helping me learn more about the advanced care planning, uh, the, or they call it the life care planning, basically. And um, no, there's we're not tracking that yet, but um, that is a good suggestion. I think it's something we should look at um, because like I said, um, we're doing this with all of our clients that we come in touch with because it's very crucial, it's very important. And even like uh, for me, I mean, learning about it and just getting to know certain things that I have never really explored, um, you know, just because of my age, you know, doesn't mean that, you know, I'll, I'll live forever, but certain things can happen and it makes me reflect on, you know, my family, the choices that I can make. I would say that if you ask me a question in the past as to where I, would, I was gonna stay if, you know, um, I ended up um, passing away, uh, I would have said, you know, I want to go back to Mexico, which would have been my option. But, um, you know, it's interesting now that I have a daughter and it seems like maybe that option is no longer there. Maybe is is the U.S. where I want to stay, is where my daughter can have access to me. And it's those things, right? And, you know, if it can start um, at an earlier than, you know, um, phase, then when you have that condition, then it, long, it can go a long way because, 
Um, I was flying uh, from Oregon to to Washington. We had a, a, a rocky flight um, because there was a lot of wind, and it was very interesting because somebody said, you know, um, is this young guy that was um, sitting next to me, and he said, you know, I was ready to die. He said, but I was I was thinking, you know, it, it's very interesting that he made that that um, that um, I guess that comment because you know. Um, it, does everybody have that form filled out? You know, what if, you know, that would have happened? And I'm always thinking about this with my clients. I tell them, you know, I've had the discussion with my wife. She knows my, you know, my choices. She knows what I want. Uh, she might not agree with all of them, uh, but she, at least she knows, she knows what, what, what needs to happen. And it's very important for us to, to have it uh, and for us to, you know, talk to our families about it because you never know when, when that might happen. And I thank you for expanding that because it really does start at 18 and it's not just about the form, it's about the discussion. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you indeed. Um, that was amazing. Uh, you know, from the planning committee perspective, all I can say is it's great when everything comes together even better than you had ever hoped. Um, so, yay. And now that our brains are full of all of this wonderful knowledge, I get to release you to lunch uh, so that you can fill up other parts of your bodily needs. So you can come back here at 1 o'clock, uh, and we'll be starting our patients, families, and clinician sessions. So lunch is to be held in the E Street Conference Room, which I understand is out the door and to the right, and down the hall, there's going to be staff and signs to help facilitate your movement from here to there. So enjoy, and we will see you back here at 1 o'clock. <laughs>